Hey, fellow tennis nerds, I hope all is well. This guy, I'm sure you know, Dennis Fabian. He's an industry veteran. He's been working in the industry. He has to correct me here, but like 20 years or something like that. Uh, he worked for Prince before. Now we've been working for Head for close to a decade. He is the global business manager for tennis and pickleball. And we're going to talk about some new products that he's uh, developing with the team there at Head. But first of all, how are you, Head Dennis? Well, thanks, Jonas, for the introduction. Good, good to be back on your podcast, actually. I guess we... As we just said, it's it's been a while. Um, I've been good, like uh, busy. I think it's a it's a lot going on. Tennis has a, has a momentum. Pickleball has a momentum. I think we as a brand are, are doing pretty well and, and doing some exciting things out there with product launches and and, and events and uh, new products. So yeah, it's it's, a, it's good times right now. I can't uh, I can't really complain aside from having a lot of work, but that's that's good, right? So. Yeah, no, work is good, generally. And uh, your players are doing really well. Like, I mean, besides Novak, which is the obvious one, but uh, Yannick Sinner this year is insane with uh, 23 match wins out of 24 or something like that. Yeah, and like, it's 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 incredible. And the way also he wins, the way he, he, he does his matches and builds his matches, builds his points. It's just a pleasure to watch this guy play tennis. It's like, it's it's amazing. I had the pleasure last year in Indian Wells to, to hit with him and, uh, that, that was that was already like kind of an experience with such a young guy and I, I mean as you mentioned i'm in tennis for a long time not only in the industry but before and there are those unique moments when you like hit hit balls with certain players and you feel there's something special and and with yannick it's definitely definitely the case he has a special sound where he hits like you you did the, the amount of, of pop he gets on his shots is just something you've i've never seen before yeah, and um, that's totally right. Um, and and it's impressive how heavy his ball is without an or with with let's say a relatively easy swing. Like so, again, we were just kind of warming up. We were we weren't even playing like full speed, and it's it's incredible how heavy the ball is. And even though he plays a relatively light light frame, like his his specs are like everyone could pick up the racket and play with it. It's it's super super light and strong. It's like not a crazy balance, not a crazy swing weight. So it's it's really nice to play with it. Obviously, it plays a full head setup, like with a prestige pro grip. He plays hawk touch strength, full full bed setup. It's super, super interesting, super nice to see. So the new speed it has been out for a bit, and now you have the new boom. You're quite always busy with with launches. Is the speed uh, doing well as usual? It's the one or your best sellers. So. Yeah, it's it's kind of our most iconic franchise these days, or silos, wherever you want to name it. Uh, obviously, like Novak made it to what it is uh, today. Like he's kind of the face of it, and and Yannick is, if I say it, taking over, it's, it it would be a stretch right now. But like they are both now representing the speed collection and. It's also from a playability standpoint. I think it, it, it covers a lot of players who can play the uh, rackets. Uh, we did some adjustments this year, like in, in layup development and made it even out of our perspective, obviously. And what we hear from the market so far is like some, some nice adjustments to the layup and, and how the sound comes into play and, and what it means for your perception as a player. We did a completely new speed team uh, mold, a uh, completely new, new racket, which is basically a scaled up uh, speed mp uh, from a mold perspective which we think is a little bit underrated these days i think more players should try it so and uh waiting for your review on on the speed team my friend <laughs> yeah we did try it me and um adri who's a uh, ex-futures player or I mean, he plays futures level still uh, and he actually was surprised that such a light racket could produce uh, a ball actually so we did a reel about it and i will do a, a review also detailing like your lighter rackets because i also have the boom team and the boom MP lights and these rackets, you know, to kind of go through the line there, yeah. Yeah, we try to emphasize the MP light rackets a little bit better, so like that that consumers who who would want to to play, like we are known for our MP friends, right? Like this is the the pros, the MPs, they we are very well known for it, and for a lot of people they are still too heavy or too demanding to to play with. So we thought like, okay, why, why not doing like lighter versions of the same frame so that, that people can experience the same head size and not doing any compromises with like a bigger head size or different kind of mold and everything. So that's why we restructured the collection as well to get all these MP lights and making decisions easier for people on the team models by reducing models over time now. And so what you will see coming there, more MPR models and then less, less T models so like that people can decide easier. Yeah, I think that's that's good. It's good to have some weights. If it's just only weight difference, I sometimes think it's a bit too one-dimensional. But to have one model that's the most important one in different weights, I think is good. 
and then you can have the different modes for the for the pro like you have with the speed for example i really like the speed pro uh, it was like knifing the ball through like a missile you know over the net it was quite kind of an addictive uh, play that that racket for me especially if you like a, a lower trajectory right yeah no definitely definitely and uh, the pro the tour and the team models will always have different modes or head size or strength patterns and, and higher or rather lower weights depending on where so that that remains but like building around the core of the mp model was kind of crucial for us yeah makes sense and this you have, you have a new paint this like so a new paint style or like a soft touch how, how has that been received so far um that's only on the speed collection like on the on the black and ceramic white uh, speed because the speed legend that we just launched last or that we kind of introduced the uh, uh, beginning of the week together with Novak, this is going to be full glossy and all black and uh, the black and ceramic one um, the ceramic white one is like with a soft touch lacquer it gives the racket a special touch and feel um, it's it's coming the, the lacquer is coming from a company out of switzerland so it's actually a quite quite pricey kind of investment also from our side and complicated in terms of the logistics and everything um, but the, the feel of the racket and how, how you hold it in your hand is, is a very special. Um, and it also has a nice impact on, on the sound and the perception of how, how to hit the ball. So I'm also curious here how, how people will, will react once they get their hands on like the Speed MP Legend, for example, in the glossy pink and compared to the Speed MP ceramic white black. So that, that's going to be interesting. But I think it's also good because people are looking for options and they're looking for for things that they they love and so i think we are delivering that pretty well right now and if anyone has any feedback like they should put it into the comment section like we always try to listen obviously yeah i think that's something you see in the industry a lot more partly it's great that you can actually have now direct feedback also with consumers but uh, is that you can have the different cosmetic options now you have that with the boom as well so like that, that i really like the fresher mintier uh Boom. What did you call it? You call it not reverse, you call it something else. Alternate, yeah. The alternate version basically. So the idea was born that we like we are always looking to like like push boundaries, right? As well. And there are certain silos or rackets where you can do it more or you can do it less with. And obviously the boom is like the second iteration right now, the second generation. We saw it like with the players who are representing it, with with Musetti and with Coco. And, and also like the playability of the frames and, and everything. And also like considering our Asian consumers and uh, all of this, having all of this in mind, we said like, okay, well, why not doing both? You know, like we got good feedback on the black and teal. We thought like, okay, let's, let's hear like more go into the direction of that new asymmetry and, and update in this regard, but then op obviously offering a, let's say a, a more progressive um, kind of cosmetic on, on the alternate version. And, it's funny, like when we presented it last May at the sales meeting, um, we had people seriously jumping on stage and kind of like, you guys are crazy, why are you doing this? Like you can't, like we are not. And, and then people afterwards, they went on court and played the rackets and they saw it kind of in the sunlight and on the court and like all of a sudden, oh, it's so great that you did something like this. It's so special and that's so cool. And some countries were like, um, well, it's going to be 80, 20, and like we are actually more moving towards 50, 50 on this record, and and that's that makes us pretty happy. And and um, there is always a certain risk if you do th such things, but um, obviously if you get rewarded for it and you get the good feedback, that kind of encourages you to to continue to do what we do. Yeah, and I think the market wants cosmetic options. Like that's what you see. People want more and more personalized things. They want to have their identity shown when they use a racket. Like they identify with a certain player, whether it's Musetti or it's Sinner or whatever. And they want to use that cosmetic because they like that player or because that they feel like that cosmetic is is what kind of talks to them the, the loudest, you know. And I think that's to have options within the same family is good. Although I assume that for you as a company, it makes a lot of complexity, right? Because you, now you have like different models with the same, with two different cosmetics and, and so on. Yeah, it obviously doesn't make things easier, but like on the flip side, that's what, what we, we are a consumer facing company. So like, and, and the brand, so we want, want to deliver for our consumers. Obviously there will always be the, a couple of people that might be disappointed because we go this or the other direction and they might have expected other. Um, but we're trying to make everyone kind of happy. We have the six silos that we have, and I think um, everyone should by now be able to find the right fit, the right cosmetic, the right colors uh, within our portfolio. If not, again, like people should comment and, and we try to listen. The planning obviously doesn't get easier because you need to 
forecast you need to have stock you need to like supply to your countries and retailers and everything so obviously that's that's a challenge but luckily we have some experienced people in this uh, field as well um, that obviously helps yeah yeah no i of course and it, like that point of being consumer facing is, is important like where the, the trend in the industry is it's important to follow what people want you know i guess that's this the with, same with strings and rackets and shoes and whatnot in terms of of, of strings you you have a, a selection. You talked about Hawk Touch. Senior uses that. Uh, you're pushing more and more on strings. We talked about like um, Hawk Power before. I think in our last podcast, well, that was a while ago. Uh, great string that worked out really well. It seems like. Uh, so what do you have in the works now on the string side of things? Yeah, just just one more coming on the consumer facing. Like obviously, you try to like listen and what people want, and at the same time, you need to kind of foresee what people might want in the future, right? Like how to because right now we are kicking off right now the collection 2026 like for bags, for rackets, for everything. So you need to kind of look into the future and, and really listen and try to filter what you get on from it. So but that's the exciting part of the, the job at the end. Uh, yeah, Strings is going really, really well for us so far. Like thanks to everyone who's kind of like buying into head strings right now. And we see a good trend and momentum that we have built up over the past couple of years. Hawk Power is outperforming right now. Like we are continuously sold out. It's kind of crazy. Like I would have never expected this. Um, obviously, a new facility in the US and everything. But like we we continue to push here as well. Uh, so we have something. I, I don't know. Like it's always tough to say nobody has done it before. But I can't remember that any time in the past the company has asked the consumers to do a play test of two versions of a string and the company would promise to launch the string that people voted for globally. So over the past one and a half years, we have developed uh, um, a string with, it's a seven sided, seven edge string, monofilament string. It's uh, made out of recycled PET material, out of water bottles basically. And the idea was born because we developed two versions of it. And we love both versions internally. And there is a 50-50 situation here in the company within the people that kind of play test and, and do all the testing. And so we were like, why, why don't we ask the outside world? Like, why do we just go with, with what people want? And um, so the idea was born that we, we have produced 500 sets total. And uh, we are sending this out globally. And um, people do a survey. And then they just have to vote for V1 or V2, so version one or version two. And so dictate what head is going to bring to the market um, beginning of next year or maybe end of this year. Obviously, we need to do the testing, which we will be running probably end of, until end of May. And by then, we can only start production. And uh, that usually takes some time. So it's not that we are doing just a showcasing of like, hey, there are two versions, but we already decided which one we're going to bring. No, there is a distinct difference between the two versions. Both are playing really well. Um, but we want to know what, what people like better. And um, so that's why then also the introduction might take a little bit longer than, than it was before. And they're the same color, but these two versions are? Yes, you won't see a difference. Let me, let me take that over. So people will ask like where they are manufactured by the packaging. They can see it. It's, it's, a, it's a made in Austria string. So it's, it's the V1, V2, and they are both that kind of how would you describe it? pearl white, off whitish, kind of the original color out of that? What you get out of that palette that you, you get from recycled uh, bottles, basically. And I already put a box aside for you and the team. So, like, once people have signed up, you decide and we will ship it. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm really excited about this one. The whole recycled material is obviously pretty interesting. Um, we have, as a brand, we have the Rethink program. So, we are trying to use like more environmental friendly packaging, reduce packaging where we can, still protecting the product. We are working on some, let's say, existing strings out of recycled material, which is a challenge because you still want the playability being the same. So there's a lot happening uh, in this regard on the, on the monofilament side. And there's a huge project actually running on the multifilament side, but like I can't really talk about this, um, but that could become a true game changer that has not yet been uh, available to people on the multifilament side. And I think that's what the industry also needs because there's, yeah, and true faith, like on the multifilament side, I don't think there has been a huge momentum of true innovation. And that's what we're listening for. 
And that's with, with all the respect for everyone who launches new multifilament strings and stuff, but it's usually like kind of, yeah, different stiffnesses, different cores, different uh, um, outer wrappings and, and whatnot. But like we're right now in the testing phase of doing something completely new. Yeah, and that's a good space maybe to be in because like, uh, I mean, some people have very strong opinions about this. I don't know where you are, but you can comment on it. But it's like most like people who are a bit worried about tennis elbow uh, should consider multi or maybe a multi hybrid at least, you know, uh, I, I I think some can play with softer polys if you reduce the tension quite a bit. So you go really low in tension. Uh, but overall, like if you're maybe a veteran player or something and you don't break strings, a multi is a good idea, you know, but not everyone likes multis anyway. Uh, so what's your opinion of this? How, how many players should use multi and, and who should, should go for multi over a poly? Too many people are using monofilament strings for too long within their racket. So I think not the string necessarily itself is always causing the issue. It's more kind of the routine of getting the rackets restrung. So if somebody likes the playability, the feel, the sound of monofilament string better, it's no problem to play with it, pick the right tension, and frequently change the string. Because the monofilament strings out of nature, and nobody kind of, even though everyone is working and has solved it, that monofilament strings never keep the elasticity and the tension as well as multifilament strings. So playing in multifilament strings a little bit longer is causing is, is kind of that, that benefit that it doesn't cause the elbow or the elbow issues or injury issues. Nevertheless, the multifilament string come with a downside of fraying and like they are like making weird noises, which are people don't like that and stuff. So um, that's that's where we are forced to work. On. And, and then maybe there's a little bit more uh, attention coming back to multifilament string. But it's it's always a a thing I like how you look at it. On the hybrid, I'm also pretty torn, to be very honest, because also here, if people restring frequently, no problem. If they keep playing that hybrid string for too long, actually the racket will deform. And so I always tell people in, in shops when they ask me and said like, like, you can do your own test. Pick two of the same rackets string it as a hybrid with the multi on the mains and the poly on the cross and the other racket vice versa put it aside for six months and you will see that one racket got shorter and one racket got longer and that changes the sweet spot so what i'm trying to say is like if you play hybrid you should also frequently restring yeah you you notice that quite i would say even quite quickly like it's um it's pretty clear from from the strings you usually do different tensions as well for the multi and the, the poly right so uh so 100 percent, very good point there i think overall like being open to restringing um and you know hopefully you have a, a like a, either a stringing machine of your own if you're lucky but also like having someone who can restring because it also freshens up the racket like you see so many people uh, playing with this same overgrip for like <laughs> six months you know and you're like what are you doing you're playing tennis twice a week and you have the same overgrip <laughs> you know well, sometimes I, hope, yeah. I really hope that everyone is also wearing new socks and underwear after playing tennis like <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous because like it's it's also not a huge investment right like um and i'm totally with you it's it's kind of like a prevention on like the the bacteria and everything that's in the overgrip automatically if you especially if you play on clay and stuff yeah, change it. And also, it actually helps to prevent elbow too, because like the more slippery the grip gets, the more you like subconscious, um, like start to hold the racket harder and like you, you push more, which like then puts some pressure on your elbow muscle. So it's, it's always a combination, like a tennis elbow or an injury in the, in the wrist or shoulder is not, it's usually not coming from one single thing. Like it's the balls, it's the, the string, it's like the grip, the grip size. So. If, if you truly have issues, look into all of this and, and kind of get a feel what you prefer, what you like, and observe yourself a little bit. I agree 100%. I think you know, sometimes people play with too small grip sizes so that you have the same problem with the grip, like they grip too tight because they, and that's how the the thing gets up into your you know elbow and, and stuff like that. So there's there are a lot of things. You have to really take a long, hard look at yourself and see, well, what am I doing technically? What am I doing with my equipment? Am I not stringing? You know, often enough, or am I stringing too high of a tension? You know, now what do we see tensions going down overall? Yeah, I mean, restringing is still the number one thing that people are not doing often enough. And I think the investment into a restring is much better than sitting at a doctor's office or like like playing with tapes and whatnot. Like you, 
we all know this from the clubs when people well, sometimes people even wear the bracelet with certain pride or something i don't know why but it's, it's kind of weird but yeah we we see it in in, in any wells we do the stringing service as you guys know and um we also see that for example let's say when i joined the industry or when i was also stringing on tour like 15 20 20 years ago it makes you feel old if you think about it um we saw that especially on the WTA tour, like the players were not actually restringing the rackets um, as often as the men would do, which kind of was weird to me because like, why, why am I making a difference there? And now I think with the new generation of players and coaches and everyone coming in, like also on the women's side, there's way more attention to like uh, getting the rackets restringed, which I, I really like to see because it will help to for injury prevention and stuff. Um, and and we kind of see now at the services that it's kind of equaled out, like how many rackets get dropped off by men and women, which I think is cool. Um, it's it's more work for us, obviously, so we need more stringers, but that's fine. Uh, and but what we also see is like the 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 drop intention uh, across the board. If you want to see, let's say, a, a trend, there will always be those extremes, right? And Yannick probably is one of those. He's pretty high up with this tension. Yeah, the way it's the ball makes some sense. But it works well for me. <laughs> what are your intention, by the way? What are you straightening with? Um, when when I was actually actively playing, I was in that range of 28 to 30 kilos. Um, and I I like my rackets being like um, used for like 20 minutes and then, then really play with it. So like the super fresh strung, like that's why I overstretch the string most of the time. And now, now that I'm not hitting as much anymore, I'm more doing play testing and stuff. Um, I kind of get used to that 24, 25 kilo string tension, um, depending on the string, depending on the string and also the frame. I go lower with a denser string pattern and go a little bit with the more open. Yeah, I think that's generally what what I do too, and what should be recommended. Like if you play 18, 20 on a 98, 95, uh, you can go quite low and still get uh, a very good control. From the racket but a little bit more open you don't string opens up a bit more with a lower tension yeah. you know that's what you're seeing on the tour as well like people go very low now like on the clay season it's going down like 42 pounds certain players you know and stuff yeah like absolutely. That. absolutely yeah so uh so new strings to come and uh, when it comes to balls are you responsible for that as well or no no i'm, I'm not in the in the ball segment i'm actually quite happy i'm not involved in balls like <laughs> <laughs> it feels like you can't do anything right with balls like following anything on on social media no matter which brand and stuff and i think if, if a tournament is over and nobody has complained about the balls then it's already a success kind of um but i think also here the same way as with the injury you need to look into into all the details right the the way players are striking the ball is different like the strings they use are different compared to other years they use rough versions or they use like edge strings um, more open string patterns are used more spin is being played by the players the Chords have been slowed down with um, with different grid levels and, and different like size of the clay and all of this. So it's always a combination um, of, of things happening. Um, so, yeah. But hey, I'm, I'm not involved. So like... <laughs> yeah, you don't get all that crap. No, no, but it's like, uh, it's been a big conversation because people think like, oh, the quality has gone down after COVID, etc. I Definitely a good point that Things tennis has evolved quite drastically. If you look at like the last ten years, uh, even like in the modern era, you know, you see that how much it changes every five, ten years. It's just uh, they they are so more physical. They hit with so more much more spin, and they never miss now. Like the, the rallies can be endless, but the pace is still high. So it's it's uh, it's it's a different game nowadays. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we supply, for example, in Indian Wells, we are the official ball sponsor because like. With head, we own pen as well. So in the US, we, we are the number one ball brand with pen. And uh, we supply way more balls also for practice and stuff for the players so that they can change uh, way more often because of the reasons you said. Like if you, in the past, there was a way more serve and volley games. And so like the, the, the rallies were a little bit shorter. The styles were different between the different players. And I'm, I'm not even judging which I like more or not, but like it's, it's, it's just like, but. What I can guarantee is that the quality hasn't been changed. Like it's not... makes sense. Uh, in terms of strings now, like if we go back to that, like the string landscape now, especially as someone who tests a lot of strings, it's insane, right? Like there's so many brands uh, being like white labeling uh, new things, and and it's the same factory, and it's a new string, but it's just they just changed the name. 
And it can be quite frustrating for me that it's like there's so many brands and I get messages every day like, oh, can you test our string? And I'm, I'm nowadays, before I might be like, okay, uh, but now I, my time is limited and I can't just keep testing strings. It just eats out all my time. And then I see that it's the same string as another string I trusted under another brand. Is that something you notice as well? And how do you stand out in that kind of landscape of strings? Yeah, I mean, this is the biggest challenge, right? Like, if, if, I, if you, even if I look on Instagram, I get like all of a sudden, like um, advertisements pop up from factories. So it's like, why don't you start your own string brand? Um, like you can, you can have made in... Uh, Germany polyester strings, uh, 500 sets and uh, 100 reels as your minimum order. We packaging them in whatever South America, and then we ship them around the world. I'm like, whoa, that's interesting. Like, what the hell is going on? And, and like, if you go online and you see all the small brands, and like everyone is trying to get into it. Obviously, everyone into the monofilament business because that's way easier to produce. It's cheaper and like, or like cheaper. For those who do this kind of business, like uh, with our strings, I can guarantee that every single string that we have on the market is, has been run through our R&D department together with the R&D of the individual manufacturers that we work with. So there is no string that is just, oh, let's do it because somebody else does it. Obviously, there have been some really successful strings in the market. Uh, which like you definitely look into and you hear the feedback from people. So you kind of get your own interpretation of it. Or like you try to like eliminate weaknesses that you kind of identify. But from our perspective, like it's definitely every single string is engineered. Like we really look into the details of the, the raw materials, the stretching, the machines they are made on. Are they cooled down by water? Are they cooled down by air? Um, how is the stretching going? Like how many times? Uh, the speed, the everything. And we're actually doing a lot of research and um, people might not believe sometimes with the amount of strings and everyone says, oh, it's, it's the same. It's coming out of that factory in Austria. So like everything is the same. And there is another string that's it's exactly like Sonic Pro. It's like, no, like if you really look into the all the details, it's not like, um, so it's, it's sometimes a little bit disappointing how much chatting is going on there and like how much kind of knowledge is not there <laughs> about all the details and it's sometimes very interesting to follow when people outside the brand tell you what's actually happening inside your brand um that that's i follow those those very curious because i'm always searching for those people here in the office and i've never seen them when I start talking about it <laughs> it's a it's in the forums i guess they go they go a bit crazy with stuff you know uh, yeah, but I like I like when people discuss. I like when people like go for it. And, and but if they pretend to know something, then it's it's sometimes getting stressful to follow. I I can understand that from your point of view. When it comes to the players now that like there's more and more information out about gear and there's more people talking about gear all the time. Are they more picky now? Like are they more into like I need to change this? I need to tweak my racket? Is that something you've seen? It's, it feels like a little bit of a trend that they're more aware at least. I'm not sure if it's it's really that they are more aware than in the past. I think it's more public. It's more a public conversation. People seem more like in the past, probably with let's say times before like the true social media and um, smartphone situation where people can film players um, when they are practicing. I think that happened in the past more behind closed curtains, and now it's a little bit more public. So that you kind of get the sense that that it's happening more than it happened in the past, but. I can guarantee if I look into our, let's say, uh, archive of records, for example, for pro players, I can guarantee that there has been a lot happening the past 30 years already. And players are always interested. It's it's a character thing, you know? Like, there's some players out there like, you know what? Like, I'm set. I'm done. I don't want to change anything because it just makes me nervous if I keep switching or trying. And there are others of like, how, how can I push? How can I push? I want to look into everything, into everything. And it's it's kind of a mentality thing. I also hear I wouldn't judge whether it's good or bad. For us, it's obviously cool if you have players that are interested because they hit with a different speed, like the swing speed, the way they hit the ball, the way they strike the ball, the way they feel the racket. It's on the next level compared to even if you are by yourself a very good player, it's different when you are professional. And and so it's always good to get like products being stressed to the maximum, especially on strings or frames, you know? 
Yeah, no, that must be great. And also having someone, even though you have to might have to send frames or have to send customization or different options or new strings or whatever you have to uh, supply the player with, you get some excellent feedback from like top pros. Like that must be a, you know, like a big plus anyway. Uh, although most people, I would guess, they don't want to tinker at all with anything, especially if they're winning. Like, I mean, I don't see Yannick wanting to change his setup. You know? No, <laughs> that, that's not probably no. Which is let's let's be honest, it's, it's understandable, right? Like why. There's a, there's a saying why why changing a winning team and 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 maybe there will be times when they need to look into something new and I think every player if you look into every player's career like they all kind of got got through that kind of momentum where they they change certain whether it's a string pattern or like the the weight of the racket or the balance the swing weight everyone goes through it and more players some players are more picky others are less so yeah makes sense. So if we look at your silo, now you have six um, racket lines, right, for, for consumers. If we start with the, the lowest uh, in terms of power, and you have your CPI scale, you're still working with that, right, like the, the, the power scale. Yes, and we, are, we, are, we will be introducing for the 2025 season, we will be introducing something new that, that um, might be even easier for consumers because that's kind of where we challenge ourselves to make it simpler, right? Uh, we, we sometimes get critiques that we have the six silos uh, on the flip side, Within each silo, we have the lowest amount of rackets compared to our competition. Um, so we are wider, but we are not as deep as others. And yeah, we have the CPI. I mean, if you go like prestige, pure precision, full, full on, like you can, like a laser, and you can point on the court, but you need to be able to maneuver the racket. You need to be able to play with a thinner frame. Then Gravity, I would consider as kind of like the modern prestige, like the bigger head size, um, the game style, the way the layouts are manufactured and, and the collection. I think that's kind of the next one. And obviously Radical, it has a more plush feel also to it. than Radical with that very traditional crisp feel, very direct, very nice, smaller head size. I think it's still a pretty versatile racket because it also delivered a decent amount of power for such a frame, like in, in balance. Um, so, so kind of, it's 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 very precise and and but still powerful and crisp. Um, then you got like this speed, which I would consider nearly as like an everybody's darling frame. It's it's a, it's a like it's it's just very nice to play with the the speed. You pick it up, you feel comfortable with it. It's super nice. Um, then boom, obviously goes also in that that direction a little bit more powerful, a little bit more of the extra kind of, and even a little bit more plush. Uh, and then the extreme, you got like everything you need in, in power and spin. Like uh, whoever is missing spin or power on the extreme, I, I don't know what else we need to do. Yeah. Uh, the instinct no more, or, or is it still around? Um, instinct is is in existence, but um, it's um, it's not really there anymore. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to phase out at some point. Uh, in terms of like, so I'm a player. I, I love the the radical MP. I used a long time uh, for uh, tournament matches and stuff that I play the the ITF seniors and whatnot. Now I'm, I'm I need a bit more spin and power, so I'm I'm tweaking in between the extreme tour and the boom pro. Uh, and they're they're quite similar. The good thing with your lineup, like sometimes I can understand that it can be confusing, but like you say, there there's not that many models within the silo you want to play, right? So if you're like, okay, I'm I like this gravity. I like control, but I want a bigger sweet spot. So you go gravity, for example. Then there's not like an endless array of models. You can go like MP if you want a lighter one that's a bit more plush, and then you go tour, and then you go pro. So it's it's kind of you know uh, not that much to choose from. But I'm in between. So radical and extreme tour, which is the more uh, spin friendly control racket, and kind of the one I'm most you know going for. And then you have the boom pro, which is new and uh, a little bit different. Uh, which one would you choose and, and why? <laughs> give me give me some advice. I played the Boom Pro for for a long time right now. Um, basically, until we until I switched to a new development for 2025. Uh, so, but like for me, Boom Pro was was my my choice of racket. I kind of like the slightly different um, shape of the head size and or the frame itself uh, and the mold. I love the the that. More plusher impact feel, a little that little bit of extra power. I'm not playing with a lot of spin, like by myself. I'm I'm more like a flat hitter, and so the Boom Pro was the better compromise or the better racket for me uh, compared to the Extreme Tour. The Extreme Tour, I love to play. If I play it, it's super nice. If you play it with Lynx Touch, you got that little bit more crisp frame with that softer string. That's super nice too. 
Yeah, that, that I liked. I liked the Lynx. I remember trying that Lynx Touch in Extreme Tour uh, with some minor customization. That was that was actually a good setup uh, in that sense. I played with that while on the on the previous Extreme Tour. Uh, so so that's the thing. Like they, when you, I also think that there's something I get comments about. It's like depending on what surface you play on a lot, and like obviously your style, but it's also related to the surface. Like I I used to play only on hard courts. Now I'm in Spain. I'm playing a lot on clay courts, uh, and then like the Extreme Tour gives me a bit more height over the net a bit more free launch compared to the radical mp which i was using before so it's like that also makes a difference it's kind of in the same feeling of a frame but it's i get a bit more lift on the ball which i need on clay because everybody's spin, like here everybody plays crazy spin you know if you play on decent level right? so. we we have two cards at the office here like a hard court and a clay court i'm if you see me play always on the hard court i grew up in the u.s on hard court and i just the way i i play it's like clay is uh it's also too much running around. Like I don't like it. Yeah, it can be frustrating. I, I like especially on a windy day when the clay blows in your face as well. I remember that match with uh, Roger and Rafa, for example, like French Open final, where it was like just a storm, uh, or what semi final maybe. It, just like that kind. That's not a fun day when you're getting clay in your face. You have to move, and you're playing someone who's you know screaming on every ball and they're hitting with only massive topspin yeah. <laughs> all the time. Like it's you're, you're going to be out for two hours and just running side to side. It's not the most. Fun. No, def definitely, definitely not the most exciting. I know you have a packed schedule, Dennis, so I might have to let you go. I guess it's uh, the hard out. Uh, but it was great talking to you. I think we should do this more often. And uh, I'm very keen to not to test the uh, strings and the uh, new models coming out because uh, it's going to be exciting. Yeah, definitely. You let me know what you need, and then we will arrange everything. Like I already put them aside here, so we'll make it work. Awesome, man. Well, I wish you the best of day, and uh, hopefully we meet soon. Whether you come here into Spain or I, I, we meet somewhere out there on the on the tour. Yeah, same same to you. Thanks for the opportunity again to to speak to you and to your audience. Uh, uh, and then people should leave some comments there if they have any questions. Uh, like send them along to me, and I'll, I'll try to answer them too. No problem. Awesome. Well, you have a great day now. Thank you.